All right, Grant, thank you so much for being here. Uh, very much looking forward to doing this uh, with you. I've been following uh, the Whatnot story just sort of passively for a, a while now. Um, and, you know, when I had the opportunity to kind of talk to you, I was, I was pretty excited. So uh, thank you so much for doing this. I think it'd be useful to start maybe with a little bit of your background. Uh, I know that you've worked with a couple of other organizations kind of prior to this, but like where, what led to the inspiration for Whatnot? Sure. And uh, thanks for having me, Sean. Um, yeah. the, the, so I'll go what I did and then the inspiration. Okay. They're a little bit, you know, they're somewhat linked, but they're also not linked. And I'll kind of get to that perhaps. Um, sure. So my background, you know, I've mostly been working in tech um, 12 or 13 years now. I actually did a quick stint in management consulting before I got into technology. Um, but I try and forget those days. And... <laughs> um, <laughs> Then, you know, my career in tech started at Google. I worked at YouTube for about five years doing marketing. And after that, flipped into um, doing my own startup kit, also in social commerce. And then um, that ended up getting sold to Patreon. And after that, um, stayed there for a little bit and then went over to Facebook as a product manager to work on Oculus. Um, kind of just wanted to change and work on something cool and interesting. After yeah. a couple of years at Facebook, um, kind of had the itch to start something again. And, you know, when, and, you know, I did it with my co-founder, Logan, and when we, the early days of whatnot, we basically kind of agreed on kind of two premises. Um, one was we're going to start a marketplace because we had a lot of background in marketplaces. So everything I'd ever worked on was like a two-sided platform or marketplace. Yeah. And then it was kind of similar for Logan's background as well. And then the second was just a set of principles for how we we're going to run the company. And, you know, I've been following kind of consumer startups for a while. And, and broadly, my observation was most consumer startups don't start and end in the same place. So to think you're going to mm -hmm. be able to predict uh, kind of consumer taste particularly well and know which direction you're going to head into out the gate is probably incorrect. Yeah. And so so what we we did instead was we just said all right, three principles for how we're going to operate. One, we're going to be exceptionally customer centric as opposed to like vision driven. So we're not going to be obsessed with the idea that we know what's best for customers. We're going to let customers kind of tell us and, and formulate a product around that. Uh, number two is we're going to be very, very fast. You know, software these days, particularly with all that, you know, software as a service tools means you can build an MVP of just about anything in a really short period of time. Yeah. Uh, and then we're going to take big swings. And so that was the genesis of whatnot. And, you know, our first, the first thing we actually went to do we're like, okay, what's the most broken marketplace in the world? And they're like, oh, it's Craigslist. It's going to feel like <laughs> everyone else. And then we're like, all right, we're going to build like a full service Craigslist and make the experience much better. And then you know, Logan started building it and I started validating the business. And after a week, um, decided we couldn't make any money. So we're like, all right, we got to change our idea. And so um, that's kind of when most of what not in its kind of current form came to life, which was we could see that there was a new generation of collectors entering the market. And, you know, collectors have historically shopped at eBay and that experience hadn't changed for a really long time. So we thought there was, with this new generation entering and the fact that, you know, previous incumbents had innovated a lot, we thought there was an opportunity to build a really great experience around that. And we thought there might be something around social commerce. And that was mm -hmm. kind of it. And at that point in time, um we just said all right we're gonna go all in we're gonna start whatnot it's gonna be collectibles focused we started mm -hmm. with funko pops which are like little vinyl dolls okay. um we didn't have the video component but we kind of knew social now mm -hmm. so that's that's how it started now i say it's kind of intertwined to my past where if you look at my past like what whatnot is today is like an intersection of those things it's like yeah. youtube and social commerce which was my first startup so yeah. I think there are like these circuitous paths you run down. We, it wasn't planned, but we kind of, I think when you have a bunch yeah. of knowledge on something, you can apply that in interesting ways. And un, yeah. kind of in an unplanned way, we applied it and kind of came to whatnot as it is today. Got it. Lots of, lots of questions coming up. So um, first of all, you and Logan, did you know each other prior or had you worked together prior? So we'd known each other for probably five or six years prior, okay. and we'd worked on like side projects together. So we'd never Got started it. a business, um, but had built stuff and kind of- You had a good sense run. of how each other worked and all of that. Got yeah, it. that's right. And, and were those three kind of core principles, were those um, 
was that something that you both kind of had talked about kind of prior to this, or was it when you sat down and said, we want to, we want to work together now, let's kind of articulate sort of our point of view on the world. How did it's, that, how did that evolve? Yeah, it's more the latter. And some of those okay. kind of born out of my first experience where I think the initial team wasn't super aligned on how to operate. And I think that's mm -hmm. probably, you know, when you, the number one reason early stage startups fail is because the founding teams break apart. Like yeah. that, is, that is literally the number one reason. And so yeah. it's really important uh, to be aligned on those things and to make sure that as the early team operates, you operate as one as opposed to like one person wants to build a perfect product, one person wants to build a fast product. They're like ship fast. Yeah. Those things are like right. mutually exclusive ways of operating. Right, right. Um, right. But we'd known each other for a while. So I don't yeah. think any of it was a surprise. It was just yeah. like, let's just write it down. So, yeah. so we're like, we agreed to this up front and we don't go back. Uh, on what was later. the, what was the rationale behind the big swing piece? Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously that's what venture to a large degree is interested in, um, power law and all that, but, but was there anything else that, you know, either from kit, uh, or your experience kind of generally that kind of informed that concept? And what, I guess the question is like, how did you define big swing? How did you know when you were taking one? Yeah. I mean, it was this. I think it was this idea that historic, like over the past 10 years, um, I've been on lots of teams that like to operate incrementally. Mm. And so I think, um, you know, one of the things that's permeated kind of Silicon Valley, I think to some detriment is just tons of A-B testing. And, okay. and so like people are like, all right, I'm going to change the color of a button or um, let's redesign the homepage and A-B test it to make sure it works. And yeah. when you operate in that sort of way where you try to test every little change, um, mm. you, you've, it's very hard to get to an entirely new product experience from there because you're changing so many things and then you move so slow as a function of that. And so it was basically mm. throwing out this, throwing away this idea that you should, you know, incrementally get to a good experience or you can A-B test your way there and, and said mm. it's like, no, we're going to create a piece of art. We're going to create something wholly new. And that wholly new experience is not driven by data. It, you know, there's a data element to it, but not wholly driven by data. And it's instead like constructed by what we think is good. And then mm -hmm. there is the flip to that, the other side of that too, which is like, we were going to start a venture funded business. Mm -hmm. So venture funded businesses only exist if yeah. uh, you're going to create like a billion dollar plus company. Right. And right. there's no way you're going to, create a billion dollar plus company by stringing together a bunch of small things. Yeah. It's interesting, you know, cause you, 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 your first principle is around kind of staying close to the customer. And that's, that's been a discussion around the pros and cons of lean startup and, you know, a customer development focused approach to building companies. And one of the critiques of it, if I understand correctly, has been that, you lead to incremental improvements when you do that, because when you talk to customers, it's often difficult for them to envision a completely brand new way of seeing the world. So how did you, I guess, how did you navigate that tension by being very customer driven, customer informed, but then baking a large vision kind of on top of that to create something that is kind of brand new? Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I, I think it makes sense. Um, you know, they, I'd say it's slice it in a couple of different ways. Um, one, I think this is probably a Steve Jobs quote, or it's one of these people. It's like, customers are very good at telling you the problems. They're not very good at telling you the solutions. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I think any product team or company that literally um, just does exactly what customers say is not going to create a coherent, uniform experience that's supposed to like, you know, be great at one thing. Like greatness doesn't, yeah. Greatness doesn't come from consensus. <laughs> it comes from like getting all of the information and like plotting your path. Um, yeah. So I think that's that's probably one. Um, you know, number two is you have to have your own opinion. Um, mm -hmm. Like what we built, what not. When we, you know, the big moment that what not took off was around when we built live shopping. And mm. we built that because um, Logan and myself believed we could just build a really cool experience around it. There was mm -hmm. no like... The business logic was like, oh, QVC is a big business. Yeah. Eh, this experience we think is going to be really cool. Let's just build it. 
Yeah. And um, with because we were close to the customers, um, we knew that they would think it was cool. We thought we, they would think it was cool. I don't think we, you know, you, know, you can't have absolute conviction. Yeah. Um, and then the third thing I would say is um, customer feedback's probably better once you've um, gotten product market fit on something and then mm. are incrementally tuning the experience. That's probably yeah. much more valuable. Um, yeah. And so I think that's kind of how we, we think about it. It's like, know what it is, still like have the art come in. And then yeah. once you've built something that people really want, that's probably when customer feedback is at its most valuable because yeah. you just like start fixing all the things that are broken according to them and the experience gets way better really, really fast. Um, Along those same lines, you mentioned the A-B testing kind of piece. Is that, is, is it safe to say that you, you know, there is a point in time where that's helpful? Uh, you know, I mean, for one thing, like when you're starting early on, you don't have enough data to be statistically significant and all that kind of stuff. And to your point, like you can't, you can't move fast enough to um, find those kind of big wins. Do you feel like now, you know, kind of post product market fit now at the stage that you are at uh, some of that kind of stuff makes more sense or do you still say, no, like we're, we're still going to try to take massive swings even at this stage. And if so, like, how do you, how do you um, avoid breaking the thing that's working uh, and still go for, go for home runs? Um, well, so I think, so there are a couple of things to unpack there. So, uh, I'll just say like AB testing on whatnot today is a tool used very sparingly. So, yeah. uh, we use it, but you use it very sparingly. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I think, um, you know, coming up with a whole new experience using AB testing, using user feedback, all of these things are tools, uh, that yeah. you should probably have in your tool belt. Um, but you need to know their limitations and when they're good and when they're not good. And, mm -hmm. and I think if you take any one of those things to its extreme, and that's the only way that you drive and deliver product or run your business, you've probably yeah. done it wrong. Yeah. Um, so, so I'll say that first, then, um, you know, as the business has gotten bigger, there are, pro there are certain areas where it's like, if, if you have high conviction in a decision and you believe it's going to be a much better user experience with like, you know, 95 percent plus probability it's almost uniformly better just to like ship it mm -hmm. you can you can measure pre and post but don't wait tons of time and we're at a very sizable scale today and we do a yeah. lot of things where we just we still ship it we look at the metrics so you know you can use you can use a b testing you can use pre and post you can use user feedback we use all mm -hmm. those in some capacity so we still do yeah. a lot of that now there are some things that are like hard to understand um how the impact of what we're doing affects the user experience. So the, I think the easiest one where that's really hard is with um, ranking and recommendations. So if mm. you go to the, if you open, if you download the whatnot app, um, the first thing you see is going to be a feed that says for you, which mm -hmm. is our, our recommendation system. And that, and that recommendation system is different for every single person. Mm -hmm. And so as you know, we try and have a team, we've built a team that we think is really has really strong product sense. So everyone on everyone on the engineering and product, team and design team goes through a product interview. Um, and we've done it that way so people can make sound product decisions. Now, no matter how sound your judgment is, you can't really think through X millions of permutations of ranking on the home feed. So you know what? In yeah. most things ranking, we ate the test. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, I want to come back to the, I want to come back to some of the, the, the team stuff and the product stuff in a, in a minute, but um as it relates to kind of the idea and, and stepping back and thinking about either the, either the problem or the opportunity that you all saw and it your the idea of kind of live commerce i think is a lot more established like in asia and things like that and it's still kind of getting adoption here what was it that you saw emerging that made you think that would that would get play here why do you think maybe it it's a little bit we're a little bit behind uh, some other countries in terms of adoption. Um, I guess what was sort of the inflection point or the kind of key insight that you saw when you were thinking about that? I don't, <laughs> I don't think it was magical if I'm being honest. It was, you know, me and my co-founder were really close to collectors in the collectibles community. At that point in time, we were just selling Funko Pops and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, we followed all these people across social media. Mm -hmm. um, we were friends with them. We talked to them all the time. And we could see 
people hacking live video in interesting ways. Be like someone's on YouTube and they're holding a live auction in the comments. Yeah. And we went, we watched it, we attended, and we would bid in the comments, and it was really fun. Yeah. Like, wow, this is really, really fun. But this whole experience is really broken. So there's no payments, there's no logistics, there's no reviews to ensure trust and safety, there's no great customer support built around it, discovery is impossible. What if you could bring that all together into a marketplace experience and you solve a bunch of problems? Won't that mm-hmm. be much better? Won't that be really fun and cool and interesting? Mm-hmm. And and that was it. Where it's like, yeah, it would be really cool, fun, and interesting. We would use it all the time. Uh, Logan, can you figure out how to build it? All right, I'll figure it out. And and then like, you know, you need to have some sort of business logic behind this. We were, yeah. we had no idea what was happening in China. We just, but we obviously knew what QVC was. And we're like, oh, QVC is an eight billion dollar business. Yeah, it's probably something here. Yeah, and that was it. One of the one of the interesting things about I mean, and I don't know if this was deliberate or not. Uh, you know, you mentioned kind of trying to do the Craigslist thing and kind of quick quickly figuring out monetization was going to be a problem. It's it seems like this is one of those uh, maybe too rare kind of instances where you you honed in on a social kind of experience that has monetization baked right in, and in fact is essential to the experience. Is that was that deliberate, or did you just happen like six months later be like, oh, this is great, you know, like. So the, my first startup, we didn't really figure out monetization that well. And, mm. and so as a function of that, I was scarred. And so um, <laughs> for my next startup, I knew yeah. we were going to build a marketplace and I knew we were going to take a cut of sales because yeah. I just, there's too many things that you have to figure out in the early days of a startup. And I just felt like that was one of fewer things that I wanted to figure out how to solve. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. That makes sense. Uh, you had mentioned that your background was in uh, yeah, a lot of background kind of in marketplaces and that kind of thing. Uh, you know, obviously people talk a lot about, uh, you know, chicken and egg and all of that kind of stuff. Um, what, what maybe were the, uh, I guess if you had like a unified theory of building a two-sided marketplace, you know, informed by your previous experience that you kind of brought in to, to bear here to maybe navigate all of that a little bit more successfully, than you otherwise might have like what were some of the insights or some of the beliefs that you had about how we go about building this two-sided marketplace well <clears throat> so, so probably some i'll take from logan because he came from another marketplace called go which was a sneaker marketplace okay and um the 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 thing with the two-sided mark like so my belief on the two-sided marketplace was um I mean, you have to you have to solve for both sides at once, and so you're just looking for a hack. There are some people who go about it with, um, all right, I'm going to build like a SaaS tool, and then over the top, then I'll build the marketplace. Yeah. Um, I tend to not like that approach. I, I think you can get yourself into a situation where you've never you you focus so much on one side of the marketplace that you don't build the muscle to figure out the other side. So I tend mm. to like the idea of of trying to figure out an initial hack um, yeah. to get you the supplier demand side and mm-hmm. then literally work on both at once because yeah. the truth is for you to build the build a marketplace that works, you have to have both sides working. So yeah. what we did was um, we we basically scraped all this pricing data off the internet for, mm-hmm. for Funko Pops and then mm-hmm. built a pricing algorithm and then um, would pull our inventory from other marketplaces like um, eBay and Mercari. And mm-hmm. so someone would come to whatnot, they'd see, you know, a selection of 10,000 Funko Pops. Um, we would basically price it, scrape it, and then they'd be able to buy it from us and we don't buy it from those places. And so that was the initial way we hacked yeah. it. And yeah. then we actually hacked the, the supply or the, uh, so we did a supply hack that got us our initial buyer base. Then we rolled out selling on whatnot. And then we did demand hack where we cross-listed everything to eBay. And so we hacked both sides of the marketplace uh, to get yeah. it working in the in the beginning. Kind of back to this idea it, that I think I think you, you you can focus on one initially, but I think in pretty quick order you have to get both sides working. Yeah. Does it help at all? I would imagine that there is at least some somewhat of a Venn diagram between people who are bu- sellers and people who are buyers. Does that? I would imagine that helps. Is that accurate or? Okay. Yeah. I mean, any marketplace with the supply side and the demand side tend to have high overlap. It's much easier to get off the ground yeah, because yeah. if you can just acquire one side, you also acquire the other side. 
Got it. And then in terms of note, like making people aware of um, their ability to list and kind of kind of growing the supply side, can you talk about that a little bit more? Like you know, I like for I know you know for example, like PayPal used they 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 used eBay as well. But notifying the sellers, hey, do you take PayPal? And they're like, oh, it's PayPal. And then that's kind of how they found out about it. And they started loading in all their other auctions. Like, did you use similar types of approaches? Or how did you, how did you educate the suppliers um, that you had this audience that was wanting to kind of buy? And how did you convince them, I guess, if they were coming from eBay, what the advantages would be of listing on your site? How did you think about that stuff? So, so in the, so in the early days, you know, it was just like us selling listings off of Mercari and eBay based on our pricing algorithm. Mm -hmm. And then we marketed the business and people would come in and buy. And yeah. then as a function of doing that, they would then see that they could sell. Mm -hmm. We made selling really, really easy. It was the easiest place to sell Funko Pops. You said to like one click, a couple of photos and like sell because we had built a extensive product catalog that made listing very easy. Yeah. And then, um, when that happened, we would also then cross list it on our eBay account over on eBay. And so right. if you were a seller on whatnot and Funko Pops, um, you had the demand from our website and the demand from eBay and listing on whatnot was way easier. So we basically guaranteed you at least as much liquidity as eBay mm -hmm. and um, an easier experience uh, to sell from than yeah. eBay. Yeah. Um, and so it, it was, you know, I think, by, by probably six months into building what five or six months in, we were the best place to sell Funko Pops. Wow. It wasn't, wow. you know, it wasn't hands down because, but we did that because we had, like, we just made both sides work yeah. really well. And it was quite, there's a lot of pain in there. Like you're not, eBay is not set up for you to sell another seller's stuff. <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot of hacking and, and, yeah. you know, returns and customer experience and all of those things. But we, we spent a lot, a lot of time on that. Yeah. Did you run into any issues? I don't like Airbnb, for example, you know, they, they built off top of Craigslist early on and then Craigslist kind of discovered what they were doing and kind of slapped them on the hand. But at that point it was kind of too late. Did you run into any issues with eBay caring or not really? No, it never became, it never came to that point. Um, okay. Though, I mean, they, they're aware of us now because they're trying sure. to copy our live experience. <laughs> oh, and if, and if you go like they, they periodically will do some, and if you just tap like whatnot in the chat, it like it has it as a bad word, it just like bans it out. So they're, they're pretty well, they're pretty well aware of us at this point in time. Yeah. But was back there then, any, they didn't catch on. Was there a, a reason why uh, you said fungal pops? Why did you start with that? Or was it just, that's what you, you all knew or you had interest in it yourself? Or? We knew it. And then the data also supported that it was like a big enough area okay. and fast growing enough that we could build around it. And so that, that point in time, when we were pulling the numbers from eBay, there were just as many Funko Pop sales as comic book sales on eBay. And so, you know, it was this new collectible, it was surging and the sales volume was big enough that we felt like um, we could build a marketing plan and there was enough buyers and sellers to grow outwards from there. Yeah, got it. You have managed to grow. I mean, from everything I've read, you're the, you're the fastest growing marketplace maybe ever. Um, it, was there anything other than just other than building a product that people wanted, obviously, um, were there, I know you were pretty early in terms of bringing on heads of growth and things like that and, and kind of investing in that aspect of the business. Was there anything that you attribute that rise to outside of external market demand, outside of kind of having a product that people wanted? Were there, were there conscious decisions around finding growth levers or anything like that, that you would attribute some of that success to? Yeah, I mean, I think so. Um, so if you look at the history of like live shopping in the United States, I think people have been trying to get it working online since the early, like the late nineties. I think it's mm. somewhere I know Barry Dillard bought QVC, I think in like the late nineties to, to, because he thought he could bring it online and make even more money by reaching larger audiences. And so yeah. there's this almost like 30 year period of time where people have tried to get it to work. And we were definitely, yeah. you know, we're not, so we're not even anywhere close to the first people to try and do it. Yeah. Um, and if you look at the list list of like well-funded startups in the space, we were the last ones to enter. Mm. Um, and, you know, honestly, I boil it down to uh, the team being able to execute well across lots of different functions. 
I think yeah. when you look at live shopping, um, you, you can't just be good at that building product. Uh, you can't just be good at engineering. You can't just be good at marketing and you can't just be good at operations. You have to be good at all of them. Yeah. So we have to be really smart with how we bring it to market. We have to build a really great experience. We have to be able to scale our operations, customer support, trust and safety, all of these things mm. pretty well. So I, I mostly attribute it to um, a really good team operating really well across multiple functions. Yeah. Um, it's hard for me to like, it's kind of, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't give you one thing. It's literally all the things. And the, the reason I, I hypothesize it's that is because there's been so many people who have been funded in the space and so many of yeah. them have flamed out that yeah. the best that I can come up with is you have to, you have to operate the business well across a lot of different functions. So along those lines, I mean, I've, I've read several interviews where, you know, um, you seem, according to some of the folks that have invested in you um, and just folks that know you, it sounds like one of your superpowers is the ability to, to find, to build an incredible team. Specifically, a number of folks mentioned your ability to find talent that other people might overlook or um, just a, a gift for kind of sensing when you're sitting in front of a, a player or whatever it is. Like, how how have you gone about... Because obviously every one of those organizations that flamed out wanted to have a great team too. So like, how did, how did you, uh, how did you go about doing that? Yeah. So I don't think I have any gift or sense for any of those things. If I'm being okay. honest, I, I would okay. attribute it to just having a very high bar and spending a lot of time. Um, mm. So that'd be one. And then the other thing that I think we did well is we didn't just assume that certain profiles of people were going to be the best. Like, I do think that um, historically, like maybe the past like decade or two in Silicon Valley, people have basically hired one type of profile, which is like, I'm a computer science person from Stanford or something like that. Right. And, you know, our business is, um, our business requires lots of different knowledge. So let's just say like sports cards is our biggest category. Um, there's not too many computer science uh, majors who know a ton about sports cards and are willing to like build a sports card market and know all the nuances of that. If we just hired that one archetype, um, we wouldn't have succeeded. And I think our sports card team is one of the best teams and whatnot. You know, if you mm -hmm. look at that team, it's just a bunch of people coming from uh, a much more diverse set of backgrounds. And instead, we we kind of looked at what unique knowledge they can bring, and then like, do they have the underlying characteristics to like work hard and push and learn and get better. So I'd say high bar, really, you know, pretty stuck to our guns on process and how we hire largely mm -hmm. around our culture. Um, yeah. So everyone goes through a culture interview. So number one reason people don't get hired at whatnot is they fail in the culture interview. And yeah. I think that's the most important thing. And the second is just being willing to like know what we need in a role and know that people from non-traditional kind of like Stanford CS background or whatever have you, um, yeah. as long as they're hungry and smart, um, can add a lot of value, particularly with some of the different skill sets they bring. How early in the, in the business did you um, implement the culture kind of interview side of things and or kind of define, like when, at what point did you know either this is our culture or this is the type of culture that we would like to build? Um, we defined it in January of, 2021, I believe, okay. which is when we were 10 full-time people and we were getting ready to scale. And yep. I was like, I have no idea if these people are going to be good fits for us. I don't yeah. even know how to assess that. Yeah. Let's sit down and write it. And yeah. um, it's largely unchanged. Um, we've added a, you know, more definition around certain things, mm -hmm. but you know, the essence of it is still the essence of what, what not was in the early days. We want people who are going to move very fast, be very customer centric and be incredibly mm -hmm. impact oriented. Um, mm -hmm. And then like our nice people we actually want to work with and get along with. And that's, we have our 10 principles on our website, but it mostly mm -hmm. boils down to those couple of things. It's still yeah, the early days and whatnot. As you've managed to scale, I mean, obviously, you know, when you're talking about moving fast and all that kind of stuff, when you have a smaller kind of product footprint, uh, and maybe when you're kind of doing like MVP testing and you're using low code and all that kind of stuff, it gets, it's obviously easier. How have you managed to stay agile and move really quickly as just the surface area of the product has grown? Um, and as the, 
the ramifications of something being buggy have, you know, increased or all that kind of stuff? Like, how do you think about staying fast? So just staying fast is just a non-negotiable. Um, and so, you know, I like to, um, you know, a lot of, I think one of the mistakes that people make is they, they too often try to whittle things down to one cause or one way of operating. Like, oh, I can either move fast or I can build high quality. I yeah. can either move fast or build something that users love, whatever it is. Yeah. And so um, the the thing that we've we've tried to instill is um, there are a list of non-negotiables and they're not or, <laughs> they're and. And mm. so you have to move fast and build it for scale and make sure it's good for customers. Yeah. And, and so it's it gets, it's harder. Um, yeah. But you know, that just means we have to continue hiring good people. We as a team have to continue up leveling. And that's if you want to build, and, and we do, we want to build a generational company. Um, yeah. We're not going to be doing that by doing fast or customer centric or non state. Yeah. Well, you know, there are multi $10 million businesses on whatnot, and they need stability. And they also mm -hmm. need a lot more stuff to, <laughs> to make their businesses grow and be better. So we got to do both. Yeah. Are there any hard systems or, you know, like either technical systems or, um, you know, like sometimes organizations will use, um, you know, opposite kind of OKR metrics uh, or, 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 you know, to create that, to help them navigate that tension, their measure kind of on both. Are there any systems or things that you've done other than kind of hiring people that have that discipline um, or have that set of values that have made that easier to do? Um, so, you know, my background, I come from, I spent more of my career in, I kind of bounced between small companies and big companies, but probably more of my career at big companies. Mm -hmm. So we, we pretty early on had, you know, rigorous OKRs. We don't spend, yeah. we don't spend a lot of time planning them because you get a lot of false precision there, but yeah. we, we, we always set them and have a direction. And yeah. so, you know, if, if you looked at our OKRs last quarter, um, one of them was about growth. One of them was about building a new experience on whatnot. One was about trust and safety and one was about stability. Mm. And so in, in a lot of organizations, those things would trade off. So like there's a classic tension between kind of trust and safety and growth. So like yeah. natural to solve trust and safety, you kind of naturally put in a lot more friction in the product. And we just say we're doing both. Mm. And it just, come, it just comes back to this, like, well, if you want to create a great company, and you want to project that out five years, what probably, what are the core pillars that have to be true? And it's yeah. like, well, if I build a fast growing company and no one trusts it, it's not like I'm going to build a great company. Or if I build yeah. a fast growing company and it's, it's like, it only works for one in five people. Yeah. But yeah, the honest answer is you have to do both and it's, you know, it makes it hard. How do you navigate those tensions? So like you have two competing teams or maybe, maybe it's the same team and they're sharing kind of, they're having to navigate that tension themselves. But, um, what are there any approaches that you found to be effective when you are exploring a potential feature that that is that is skewing more toward one side than the other or how do you how do you break ties how do you how do you navigate that tension other than just saying like, obviously do both but like how how do you do it when you run into the when rubber meets the road uh, ask people to just exercise common sense mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of um, a lot of bad decisions get made because people are just looking at this singular OKR and it says to do this. But if you step back for five minutes and ask, is it good for the user? Is it good for the business? Um, yeah. You get a lot of, no, it wouldn't be. Um, and so in, you know, one of the things with OKRs is they're a good way to like directionally push you in the right direction, but they're stupid. They don't mean anything. It's like written on a piece of paper at a static point in time. And so, um, you know, you're going to get them wrong. And so yeah. I try and preach one common sense. Um, and we just like have common sense across these things. And so, you know, our payments and logistics team, uh, they had an OKR to improve our gross profit. And, um, you know, one of the things they did was I, I don't, the, I think, um, yeah, they, um, they moved a line item that wasn't sitting in gross profit, but what, which would have increased our profitability like a hundred thousand. Well, I mean, we're not profitable, but increased you know, the would have reduced the profitability or you know the, the negative profitability in the business right. by like a hundred thousand dollars a week. 
but it prevented them from hitting their goal mm. because, because they wouldn't hit their gross profit target because it fell outside of it. And it actually would actively hurt their ability to do that. And they mm. just did it. Mm. And so you know, I was like, one, I rewarded them. They're like, that's great. Don't worry about the goal. You did the right thing. Just do the right thing and exercise common sense. Now, if we saw the converse of that, it would be like, let's talk to the team. Let's pull them aside. Let's teach them how to think about this because you yeah. don't want that sort of stuff happening. So I think that's, um, you know, that's one mechanism. The other mechanism, the other two mechanisms, and I, not that, by the way, like none of these things are perfect. Like there's all sure. this sort of messy yeah, yeah, yeah. stuff yeah, in the middle. Yeah. Right. Um, we, we instituted product reviews um, maybe like four or five months ago, which is it's in a venue um, where me, um, my co-founder and our head of engineering uh, get into our, and our head of design. We don't all have to be there, but like some we're all on it. And then each yeah. of the product pods can 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 bring something there to drive through a decision. Um, and so, you know, what we do is we go into those and if we're trying to drive through a decision, we come out with a decision. And there's kind of no, um, you know, that's that's the line. We make it and we move on. Uh, similarly, we uh, probably have, uh, we still have to work on this one, but there's a general expectation that whatnot, that like if something's taking more than 48 hours to get to a decision, it needs to get escalated up into some sort of review form and just be made. And yeah. so... I'm going to talk with one of our teams later today where they were kind of meandering for a few weeks on something. And, and what we're going to say is like, never happen again. Yeah. Um, what needs to happen is if like, there's a bunch of disagreement that just needs to be put into a forum where a decision can get made and get made fast. Yeah. Um, because mm -hmm. you don't want time is very, very precious. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. You, you had mentioned the product, the, the, the product interview. Uh, I know your background is, is largely in product. Um, it sounds like you're still involved in product decisions and product review and things like that. How, um, it's something I, you know, I, I hear all the time. It's like one of the harder roles to hire for is product. There just aren't a whole lot. There's a, there's a lot of different schools of thought around what even constitutes someone in a, in a product kind of function. Sometimes it's more engineering focused. Sometimes it's more you know, design focused or whatever it is. How, um, how has, I guess your background or like, what's your point of view on that? Like, how do you find great talent? From the product standpoint, how do you um, equip them? You know that kind of thing. I don't know. I, we, have, <laughs> we're, we 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 haven't had a lot of luck in scaling our product team. If I'm being honest, it's actually one of yeah. our pain points right now. Okay. Um, you know, we've probably interviewed I don't know 700 product people and hired three, maybe wow. more. I don't know, a thousand. Wow. Um, so it's very like I don't know. The, what, are the the only what are the gaps the that only... you feel like you're seeing the most often, or like what are the where where, where are the weak? So kind of it it, it um, there's there's probably like three main gaps, and it kind of depends on the archetype of 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 person. So yeah. I think um, you know the most common PM archetype probably is someone who's coming from a big technology company. So think like Facebook or Google. And that archetype tends to overly index on data and under index on what is a good user experience, how do you build it? Mm -hmm. And so um, unless someone can like really well articulate user problems and solutions to user problems, they don't get hired. So that's probably the most common failure point. It's like people yeah. who try and overly engineer product experience. Mm -hmm. um, maybe the, the second um, most common one and this is probably where like the startup folks struggle is is on like more of the strategy side of things like talk me through how you'd set a direction for a team talk through the vision mm -hmm. um and startup people tend to be overly execution oriented but like at whatnot you have to like you have to have the intuition you have to be um very 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 well equipped to set a direction and strategy and you have to be able to execute and so, mm. and then execution would be the third one. So maybe sometimes you find people who are like really good product sense, a little bit more on the artistic side, maybe yeah. former designers, but they're like, we need people who can, all right, you have two weeks to ship something and you have to navigate a hundred different decisions and you have to get that done in less than 48 hours. Well, that's the expectation. Yeah. Wow.
So yeah, we haven't <laughs> solved this one yet. So work in progress. I'll let you know once we solve it. Good. Yeah. No. That's uh, yeah. Uh, that's that's. Um, I mean, I I admire the discipline, though. I mean, you know, especially you you. It's the team has a bias for action. You want to move, um, and then you know you raise. Um, you know, several rounds and you have growth expectations kind of layered on top of that, that are being conforced on the outside. So like to be able to maintain the discipline around hiring and saying like, we refuse to bring in inferior or mediocre talent. Uh, I, you know, I, 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 I admire that. I would imagine that temptation would be, would be there. Um, but maybe, I mean, is that just like, it's a, they're a net negative. I mean, if you bring them on and they're not good enough, is it a net drain on the business? Yeah, I mean, it's not to say we haven't made those mistakes because we absolutely sure. have. It's impossible sure. not to make those mistakes. Sure. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think we have more uh, in in certain areas we're we're better at it than others. Um, so, like me and my co-founder are heavily involved in the product, and yeah. so um, you know, every PM interviews with us, and so the bar is just naturally <laughs> very high. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think we've both been on teams and seen teams where the, the PM um, detracts from the team more than they add. And so we mm-hmm. have a little bit of scar tissue. Um, I think we have hired a lot. I, I won't lie. We're about 350 people now. Yeah. Um, I do actually think the team is very good, though. Yeah. Um, and I think you just, you, you're always, there's not an instance that I'm aware of from anyone I know. Um, who's been like, I relaxed the bar and I feel good about it. Right. And so you just have to remind your, yourself of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's usually you're setting yourself up for some mid midterm pain at a minimum. Yeah. Um, Every time so, we have, we've, we've regretted yeah. it. Yeah. How have you thought about, I mean, so obviously, you, you know, you knew what it was like working in a, in a larger organization. You had experience building a company on a smaller scale and, and, you know, getting to an exit. Um, Again, though, being being growing as fast as you have, I would imagine, has been an interesting ride. What I guess one, what has it? Because people kind of are always there aren't as many stories of that. Candidly, of like, what does it feel like to be on the trajectory that you're on? And then, secondly, how have you managed to not every, not every founder is able to go on that whole journey and they're not able to scale themselves and their abilities sufficient to keep up with what the organization needs. Um, especially when you're kind of, when your slope is like that. So like, how, how have you tried to be the guy, continue to be the guy that the organization needs at kind of each of those stages? Um, that's a good question. So, you know, I guess, I guess a few, a few things there, um, you know, the growth is unprecedented and so it is very challenging. Yeah. Um, and you know, in, in some ways it's so fast that you can't stop to think about it, which in some ways is helpful because you're like, you, you just like keep moving through the pain as opposed to like dwelling on it. Cause you're like, well, <laughs> I don't really have time to think about all these things that are going to fall apart. Yeah. Um, yeah. let's say, you know, you just one foot in front of the other. Uh, and, yeah. and, um, two, you have to try and constantly learn. I'm really lucky. I have a lot of good advisors. I have an incredible management coach. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time trying to go like, here's what I'm good at. Here's what I'm not good at. Yeah. Um, three, you know, I have a luxury, like one of the best jobs being CEO is your one. At, I can hire anyone to close any of my gaps. So I actually don't have to be the best at any any particular thing. I just have to know that I'm not good at it and then go, all right, I'm going to go hire someone who's better at this thing than me. So it's, yes. that's a profound luxury. Um, mm. And I don't, then, you know, I think there's a lot of, um, I think there's a lot of stupid stuff out there about what the CEO's job is. Mm. Um, my view on the CEO's job is they need to spend their time um, solving the biggest problems of the company um, that are not actively getting solved. And mm-hmm. so um, as opposed to like worrying about myself scaling or anything like that, I just go like, are the biggest problems that what not being solved and mm-hmm. the biggest problems that what not are being solved, um, then the business is always going to be a good place. And then of course, yeah. like a healthy, do- like high paranoia. Like I just always look for things that are going to go wrong. Like what yeah. am I doing wrong? Where is it going to go wrong? Yeah. Um, I, I do like the only the paranoid survive. And I, I think that is 
Uh, absolutely true. Yeah. Are there any tools or approaches you've found for figuring out what the biggest problems are, especially when you get to a size where you've got, everybody has a partial view of the world, I would imagine. And they have things that they think are the most important problem. You've got potentially investors, depending on the, the degree of involvement that they have clamoring in their own, in their own right. You've got customers and you're staying close to the customers and trying to kind of parse all of that. Like how do you process all of the various inputs and hone in on what you think the most important problems are that need to be solved. I mean, <clears throat> so at, at the end of the day, it just boils down to one thing, which is mm -hmm. like, how are you going to build long-term sustainable growth? Yeah. You know, the, the value that customers are getting from your business should be seen in the growth of your business. The value yeah. that investors uh, should see in your business should be found in the long-term growth of your business and the value that your employees get in the business. And then yeah. me as a you know significant shareholder. Um, yeah. and, and so it really is as simple as that. And now, mm. now then you're like, okay, what are the biggest, then you have to go like, what are the biggest drivers of this? And you know, those can change at any given point in time. Certainly yeah. one of the biggest drivers is gonna be, um, you know, make it, like hiring the best talent and making sure the best talent can succeed. Another one of those is going to be like, you understand the growth in your business. Another one's going to be, you understand what the value is and you're building towards value. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that's, you know, that's one. Then the shortcuts are, um, there are people who have been in situations like me with businesses growing really fast and you use them quite frequently. So we talk to other CEOs, the yeah. management coach is amazing. He coaches many of the incredibly fast growing companies. So he's got a tool set and a, and a guide for how to think through this. And most every problem I bring to him, he's seen before. And so that's like a helpful, yeah. helpful pattern. Yeah. Um, and, and then, you know, there are certain functions where, uh, you know, spending a lot of time on uh, HR this quarter, because um, we're, we're now big enough, we have to get a bunch of systems in place from yeah. like management development to yeah. Performance yeah. reviews to like very robust compensation that's equitable and fair. Uh, yeah. And the, you know, the shortcuts there, like go and talk to people at the three or four companies that are a couple of years ahead of you. What they do, how they do it, what they get wrong. And then you, you just apply it. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Um, well, I, I want to be respectful of your time. What do, what do the next, uh, what do the next couple of years look like for, for whatnot? Where do you see things going? So you know, you I, I think. Growth? Well, you know, everything uh, eventually, uh, you know, goes, yeah. you know, regresses towards the mean. Sure. Um, you know, we're still, still growing at um, an incredibly fast clip, and um, you know, I, I'm going to work hard to keep it that way. Um, as for as for what's next, I think it's a lot of the same of what we've been doing. So we're going to continue to focus on. Um, building a great marketplace for our collector enthusiast audience. Uh, what that means is we're going to deepen the product. So we're, you know, every week we're launching new features and we'll want to keep up that rapid pace. Uh, number two is we're going to continue to expand categories. Uh, so, you know, uh, we start in collectibles, but fashion is actually our fastest growing segment. And we're getting into a lot of other things right now. Interesting. Uh, and then we're expanding countries. Um, we launched in the UK a couple weeks ago growing incredibly fast, you can expect us to continue, you know, to more countries on the horizon next year. So, you know, I think that's the essence of the business is, you know, building something great for those collectors enthusiasts and, and then expansion, which is all about touching more collectors enthusiasts through more categories, more countries. So that's, that's kind of what I see yeah. on the pipeline. Very cool, man. Well, this has been fascinating, you know, congrats on, on, on your success. Um, it's, it's kind of staggering, uh, honestly. Uh, but uh, for folks that want to learn more either about, I guess, you uh, and what you, how you see the world or about whatnot, where should I send them? Uh, just head over to uh, whatnot. We have some stuff on our website. Um, we also have an engineering blog, uh, whatnot engineering. You can check out the work that that team's doing. Uh, they're doing some pretty amazing stuff. I'm on social media, but I don't post too much. So you're, you're best looking at the, the whatnot website or the whatnot engineering blog. Sounds good. All right, Grant. Well, thanks again. Uh, really interesting. And, and congrats again on your success. Thank you so much for having me.